Hi everybody, I've got a, uh, a bit of a tricky slot here between the tea and the beer, so I'll try to, I'll try to keep it interesting at least. Um, it's very good to be here in India. I've actually spent uh, half my adult life coming to this part of the world. Uh, I was based for a long time as a BBC correspondent in, uh, in South Asia. And it's good as well to be representing what I heard in Shri's speech is a, an oppressed minority, the white male. But I'm here as that oppressed minority. And actually, because I've been outside Europe and outside the UK for pretty much all my adult life, I've always been in that, in that position. But I do understand that diversity is key. So it's very good to be here in India. It's not only home to some of the best PR people in the world. That's you guys. Some of the best. And our Nissan team, incidentally, is up for uh, in-house communication team uh, of the year tomorrow. So a hint to, the, hint to the judges. It's also home to some of the sharpest journalists in the world as well. You know, I was a journalist, and I have to deal as a PR with uh, journalists in many different countries. Uh, and in India, they're extremely well informed and very sharp. And that's not always good for us, is it? But they're very, very professional. Um, I'd like to talk to you a bit about the way we're trying to work at Nissan and, try, and trying to make our content relevant. And content is certainly something that we're increasingly focusing on. So first of all, I've really had a journey from poacher to gamekeeper. I think probably everybody in this room has had more experience, a longer time in PR than me, because I've only been in PR for six years. So before that, as you heard, uh, I was a BBC correspondent for a long time, uh, and I joined um, Nissan in uh, Japan. So I was a BBC Tokyo bureau chief, uh, and then they hired me into a content factory. So this is me in my previous life. Um, the one in the, the middle at the top, that's uh, when I was covering the tsunami in 2004 in Sri Lanka. And in fact, um, the ruins behind me are the hotel room that I was staying in when the tsunami hit. So I was, I was on holiday there, and uh, I was in bed, and the sea suddenly came through the wall and just swept me out of that hotel room, and that was, the, that was what, what was left of the hotel. Um, but then I quickly started reporting on that. Uh, then, on the right-hand side, uh, that's the uh, earthquake and tsunami in Japan. So a bit of a theme, but I did do other things as well when I was a journalist. I covered the civil war in Sri Lanka. I went to Afghanistan a lot, uh, Pakistan, and India. So covering big news stories, but also business, sports sometimes, and of course, culture as well. Now, I think pretty much every journalist would say that they could be good at PR, right? We all get calls from people saying that they want to join our teams, um, and everybody thinks they can be good at PR, but actually, when it comes to it, a lot of journalists are not very good at PR. There's only a few people who can make that switch and do it really well. And because of that, I think a lot of people think that PR media, PR and journalism are on the opposite sides of the fence. Um, but I think that there's one way in which they're the same. And that's because what we're trying to do as PR people and what journalists are trying to do is tell stories that resonate with people. And we're trying to tell stories that change the way people perceive the world. You know, some top journalists, and I don't, I don't claim for a second that I was one, they can change the world with two minutes of television time. For us, we want to change the perceptions of customers, and we want to sell more products, and we want to build our brand. But essentially, we're trying to do the same thing. I think that to be able to do that, we really need to understand the culture of the people we're trying to talk, talk to or talk about. So when I was a journalist in Japan, unless you're going to be extremely superficial and talk about Mount Fuji, robots and geishas, you really have to understand the culture. And then you can transmit that culture or talk about that culture to an international audience on TV. And I think for us, we need to do the same as PR people. Because we need to understand the culture, not so we can transmit it outside, but so we can talk to the people within that culture themselves. Because that's what 
you know, those are the people that we're trying to sell things to. So it's the same idea. And I think the critical thing about culture is it really depends where you're coming from. And I, I had a big lesson on that about 10 years ago in Chittagong, in Bangladesh. So I'm sure people have seen, I think there's a place in India that does this as well, uh, ship breaking. I spent a long time on the beaches uh, outside Chittagong where a lot of the, of the, the world's biggest ships go to die. They get driven up onto the beach at full speed, and I experienced that, which was, uh, which was quite fun. Grounded onto the beach, and then these guys, these guys tear those ships apart by hand, literally. It's like, a, it's like an army of ants on these ships, tearing them to pieces by hand. And you can imagine this is dangerous work, dirty, poorly paid, really, really difficult and bad work to be doing. So seen through my eyes as an outsider, these guys look like some of the most oppressed workers in the world. And yeah, they are. But actually, when I went back to the hometown of these guys, because they're internal migrants, which is in Bogora in Bangladesh, and you can see in the, the photo at the bottom, those guys were kings, especially the supervisors. They controlled access to jobs. They were the ones who were bringing the money back to the village. And so they were perceived in a completely different way. And how, how you perceive those guys really depends on where you're coming from. And I think probably, maybe this is an obvious thing to say to an audience full of people who live in India, because you're used to a country with huge disparities, huge diversity. But I think lots of global brands don't get this point, that you really have to speak to people understanding where they're coming from. So, the constant is culture, and it applies to storytelling always. To report on somewhere, we have to be able to understand the culture. To do great PR, you have to understand the culture as well. To speak about people, or even more importantly, to speak to people, you've got to understand them. Otherwise, the work that we do is simply going to miss the mark, and it's going to be irrelevant. It'll be superficial. So understanding culture, the fabric, and the place where we are helps us to make brands relevant because actually everybody's experiencing our brands in a different way. Now I want to talk a bit more about storytelling because that's the, that's the subject of this uh, summit here in Hyderabad. Uh, and I think actually that when it comes to storytelling, it's not so much an art as a craft. A lot of people have a kind of innate ability to tell stories. And I'm sure that everybody in this room is one of those people, right? We're all, we're all storytellers. That's what makes us become PR people, because we want to tell stories. So that's born in people, same in journalists as well. It's that innate ability and that innate desire to tell stories to people. But when I say it's a craft, I mean it's something that can be acquired and also honed. Because we can hone the ability to make content, what's the kind of story we're going to tell. But as we travel through life, as we experience different cultures, different societies, as we uh, work in different places, as we're working on different, different projects or for different companies, as we go to different countries, um, then we can start to learn more about the culture of those places. We can start to get a greater understanding of the different types of customers that we have to talk to. And I think that's really what the learning is. So we, could, we probably all have an innate ability but we can learn and we can get better over time. And certainly from my point of view, I think the experiences I've had in life have meant that I've become a much better storyteller, and at the very least, a more relevant storyteller. So I think this is a, an interesting quote, because this kind of speaks to the, the challenge that we have in our day-to-day -day jobs, which is what are we trying to do? There's always this, this payoff, isn't there, between are we trying to sell to the next customer tomorrow? Or are we trying to build the brand over the long term? I think this quote's very right. That it's a rare marketer or a rare PR person who looks beyond the immediate consumer, who looks beyond the next sale. And this may seem obvious again, but a lot of people don't work in this way. Um, we're always working towards the next sale. And how do we get that next customer in through the door? That's what a lot of our metrics are about, how many people are going into our showrooms. 
but it's the rare PR people that look beyond that. How can they become part of the culture that is being experienced by their target customers? Now, I'm not saying that we're brilliant at this either, frankly. You know, we're, we're, we're learning this as well. This is increasingly, along with content, a focus of our work. Uh, but we are trying. I'd like to show you some, um, some examples of, uh, of some of the work we've been doing that's trying to speak to culture. Now, in this case, this is about cars that can park themselves. So we're already selling cars in Japan where you press a button and the car parks itself. And for some people, that's, you know, it's a very unusual idea that the car can drive itself and that the steering wheel can turn by itself and you hang control of the car over to, uh, control of where the car's going over to the car itself. And we wanted to make this relevant both to our audience in Japan with something that they can experience, but also show our audience globally about what it means to be a Japanese company. Because at the end of the day, we, we are Japanese. So have a look at this. So we actually we did, we did several of these in Japan, and we did one that definitely wouldn't work in India with the queuing courtesy that uh, goes on in India. In Japan, often there's a queue outside a restaurant, and people sit in chairs. And they, it's very orderly, and no one pushes in at all. And we also made those move by themselves as well. So we put our kind of self-driving self technology into the chairs, so as people move to the front of the queue, they could stay, stay seated, and the chair would move, move for them. But this is a way we're trying to really understand uh, the culture code and to, to break the culture code. Um, so how do we adopt the culture code? I think PRs and marketers must accept that the way to success is through insights into culture, into the lives and the needs of their customers, and they need to really study the people that they want to talk to. I think that's quite a challenge because often those people are not like us. You know, we, we, we're, when we talk about diversity in, in our industry, yes, white men may be, may be an oppressed minority, but actually, you know, we're also all from a similar kind of class and a similar kind of social background. And it's really how do we understand uh, our customers? So it's important how that brand stories find a cultural insight about the target audience to really get in touch with customers' lives with stories that are earn-centric and social by design as well. Now, I'd like to take a look at another example. Um, and I think the reason why this one worked, it's about Saudi Arabia. The reason why this one worked is that, as, as I'm sure some of you remember, in Saudi Arabia, women were only allowed to get driving licenses for the first time last year. So before that, women were not allowed to drive at all. So if, you, if, you, if you're a woman who wants to get to work, you had to have a driver, or you had to go in taxis, or you had to get, get your husband or brother or whatever to take you. And I think that many people around the world, when Saudi Arabia allowed women to get driving licenses, just thought, great, that should have happened 50 years ago. 
And they just, every just, just thought that's just fantastic, fantastic news. And of course, we welcomed it in that way as well. But I think that what this film and this piece of content that was made by the PR team in Saudi Arabia, uh, what this piece of content really gets under is the fact that, yes, some men in Saudi Arabia were ambivalent about the idea of women driving, but actually some women in Saudi Arabia are a bit nervous and ambivalent about it as well. Uh, and lots of people want to see somebody else start to drive before they do. So have a look at this. So I think, I think one thing those women in Saudi Arabia learned there that perhaps all women can relate to around the world is that men don't make good passengers. There was a lot of kind of backseat driving going on there, wasn't there? Uh, now that was made by the PR team. It was incredibly cheap. That was our office. The, into, the inside shots were filmed in, uh, in our office and the, the driving was done in the car park. And that won a uh, Gold Lion Award at Cannes for PR this year. Um, so, why does the culture, co co culture code matter? It matters because of a critical point that too many people in PR don't really get. You know, every day we're wrapped up in our work uh, of our business or the businesses of our clients. Uh, we spend hours crafting the perfect press release. In, in our case, because we're a Japanese company, as my, uh, my team down there will know, you spend even more hours, days, weeks, making sure that everybody in the whole company is happy with the press release before you put it out. 
Uh, then we carefully send it out at the right timing, and what we forget is that actually nobody cares. Nobody cares. All that work and nobody cares. It's true. You know, I was, when I was a BBC correspondent in Japan, I reckon I got 100 press releases a day, and I think I read one a year. So nobody really cares. Um, and that's because we live in a world in which there's just a deluge of information. There's a deluge of content. Uh, and all the different brands are vying for the attention of an audience that quite simply is ignoring them. And a lot of communication is about a sea of sameness. It's just eminently ignorable. And we have to really move from making people, trying to make people love brands to building brands that people love. And to do that, I think we have to be culturally relevant. So I'm going to show you one more video. This is, this is the last bit of uh, showing off about our work. Um, and this one, again, is from the Middle East. Uh, actually, there's probably two more. Sorry, I'm going to show off a bit more. Uh, it's again from the Middle East. And the cultural insight here was the great love that a great many people have for driving in the desert and an affinity for the desert itself. It's a cultural center. You know, the desert's the equivalent for an Indian of, uh, of their home village. Now, horsepower is the way that we usually measure the ability of our cars. It's a road metric, and it's pretty meaningless in the desert. So the Nissan GTR, which is a sports car that we do have in India, uh, it's incredibly good on horsepower, but it sucks in the desert. And so we thought we'd think about what we could do about that differently, and we did this with National Geographic. As many vehicles with high horsepower fail to perform in the sand, how can we measure their performance in this environment? This is the story of a team of Nissan engineers on a quest of innovation to introduce a new unit of measurement. فكرنا ان احنا نقدم للمنطقه ميجرمنت يونت جديده اللي هي الكامل باور The team has been working together for more than a year in research and data collection. التشريب طبعا هتكون على تراجيكتوري عنده انكلينيشن 9 درجات طوله 60 متر الكفاءه اللي اسمها للسياره هي ان 1 كفاءه الجمال ان 1 هنقسم كفاءه السياره على كفاءه الجمال بيطلع معنا الكامل باور ريتنج تبع السياره but first, the team needs to calculate how many watts are in one unit of camel power. Uh, now, the great thing about, uh, about that one was that camel power, which frankly we made up, is now an official unit of measurement in the United Arab Emirates. It's a, it, the government authority there has recognized it as a unit of measurement. So that's, that, that's the kind of way we can, we can get PR going. So uh, I want to show, one, show you one more video, this time uh, from India. Uh, and this is really a sum of a campaign that we've been running uh, over, the, over the last, well, more than a year, actually. We've been running here in India. Uh, and the challenge here was how to make the Datsun brand relevant to people. Uh, now, Datsun, we've been in India for about five years, uh, and Datsun has a very long history. You know, it started in Japan in kind of 1935, but in India it doesn't have a history at all, completely unknown. And we wanted to make Datsun a brand that was relevant to aspirers, to people who, who want to make bold choices in life. Uh, so take a look at this. It's a bit of an upsum of the campaign, which actually uh, our guys won an award for last night. Dream, access, and trust is what defines Datsun. When we decided to celebrate farmers in India, we chose to celebrate the people who live in the same values. And to discover real stories across India, we traveled from Delhi to Kolkata to Kolam, Mumbai, Assam, and beyond. On this journey, we met Datsun ready owners like Sumit Porta. Driven by self-belief, his appetite for bold decisions made his dreams come true. Rishav Basu, whose passion for theatre drove him to make his own rules of success. Harisankar Babu, 
an explorer who survived a sea storm to realize that overcoming obstacles opens up a world of possibilities. As we moved ahead in the campaign journey, we invited India to step forward and share their inspiring stories. Stories of pure determination in changing the lives of artisans of Dharavi. Of delivering hope and empowering lives for people with disabilities. Story of a farmer from world's first elephant-friendly farm. A story of love and his team packed with intent. More Power to You was also about celebrating our colleagues. We featured our very own heroes who had found their own power in empowering others, in doing selfless service and giving wings to their long-held dreams. An integrated approach made this strategic campaign fly. We garnered over 100 PR exposures, over 55 million social media impressions, 12 million video views, 10 million engagement units, generating positive sentiments around the brand. A high decibel communications campaign that put people in the center, established connect with the society, elevated brand awareness, drove quality engagement, and celebrated people who challenged the status quo. A campaign that made everyone sit up and compel them to say, more power to you. So, um, how, how to sum up? It's clear that culture is important to be relevant, and also that reputation is earned. We all know that, right? Uh, and that's our jobs. But how do we earn that reputation, and how do we change it in a meaningful way? I think the key point is understanding what reputation is in, in the first place. Uh, and I think that my opinion is that there are two different types of reputation. Character, the reputation for character for a brand is very volatile. You can kill it in five minutes if something goes wrong. Competency, I think, is the other type of reputation, and that's very hard to change. It's remarkably stable and consistent over time, and it's very hard to lose it. And I think if you, if you don't believe me, then think, you know, one good example is, uh, is one of our uh, German competitors. I'm sure everyone's going to remember that they had an emissions scandal around diesel in Europe. Now, nobody thinks that those guys are incompetent. Everybody believes that they can build cars that are not quite as good as Nissan's. But the problem, and in, and in a way, their reputation for competency was actually enhanced by that scandal because their engineers found a clever way to get around a regulation. But the problem was that that company wanted to get around that regulation, and that made it a character issue. And I can tell you that in Europe, diesel will be dead within a matter of a couple of years as a result. The sales have just completely plummeted for diesel in Europe. Now, the good news, I think, is that what goes up, what goes down, can also go up. So character is volatile as a reputation, both positively and negatively. So I think it's worth us focusing on character. And character reputation building is all about culture. It means building our brands to have the kind of character that makes customers aspire to associate with them, and it's something where we can make a big change. And the best way to do that is to make a brand that's relevant to the culture that people live in. So to conclude, in my view, understanding the culture, creating culturally aligned stories, each one relevant in a different way, we have to create many different stories, to the audiences your brand needs to address is the difference between good PR and great PR. It's the difference between good storytelling and great storytelling. And it's something that as we all travel through life, absorbing what's going on around us, we all get better at over time. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. Roland, that was wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very much. Shall we? So I think because we're talking about storytelling, uh, we will focus a bit on uh, the storytelling aspect of your career and some of the things that you've done. So as we know, storytelling is an integral part of the Indian culture. There's always been the tradition of stories and talking about them. There's been art and song and dance and all the rest of it. Uh, what is your thought on storytelling in terms of how we use it currently? In this day and age, we largely use the written form or the spoken form. We rarely, if at all, use uh, 
or art or song, of course, sometimes in video, but it's not very common. Any thoughts on how you know, we should look at more uh, storytelling aspects to the stories we tell? In terms of art and culture, I mean, I, in actual fact, we do use things like theatre in some of our communications, and particularly in places like South Africa, uh, where we have a, we've got a plant in South Africa, uh, and, a lot, uh, and when we're doing internal communications in South Africa, the people who work in that plant come from a, uh, a kind of oral, verbal, you know, performance, theatre kind of base. A lot like we society. do. Yeah. Yes. So we use, we use that quite a lot, actually, when we're talking to people in, um, in places like that, to try to be culturally relevant to, the, to our workforce. Right. I, think, I think as well that video is key, really. I mean, sure. The written word has no impact compared to a video. You know, a video, a short piece of video can literally change the world. It really can. You know, TV journalists have done that. Correct. And I think as well that probably video is increasingly an important part of our culture. And I think there are many people like Sri who spend so much time on their mobile phones in India that they get a problem with their neck. I mean, that's, that's, this is just the way we live our lives, isn't it? Uh, so I think that that kind of content that's tailored for mobile Particularly something that's something, you know, video and television is a medium of emotion. So video is the new drawing on the rock. Yeah, I mean, we're, yeah. we're increasingly focusing on, on video. Right. So yeah. other kinds of graphic, you know, graphics and things like that. Correct. But it's the kind of thing that, you know, yes, things like theatre are relevant in some places and to some audiences, but actually the majority of our audience now are, are like Shri. Sure. They use different uh, modes. So in this whole multimodal communication situation where there are constantly messages coming at us and we're constantly receiving input, uh, is it worth looking at short bursts of story or is it a, a larger reiteration of a campaign that would really work? In terms of a storytelling, do you want to look at pieces of a story or a big story? What is your take on something like that? Uh, I think that too often, and you know, we're, we're guilty of this as well, too often uh, you know, the, the customers out there are talking about one thing and we pop up and try and make them listen to us talking about something else. Right. Uh, you know, just once. And that, that's just not going to work. And I think that what, what we need is, an, is a narrative. Uh, and I, I actually learned this when I, was, um, when I was a correspondent for the BBC, because for long periods of time in some of these places, you know, Japan, for long periods of time, there's actually nothing interesting happening. That's just a reality. So you have to, you have to, find, you have to try and come up with a narrative. You know, is it when you're a journalist, is it there's a new government in power, how is that going to change Japan? And then you can ring up the news desk and you can say, you know this thing I've been banging on about for the last two months? Well, this is the latest chapter in that story. Um, and I think that for us as PR people, we need to do the same. There's no point in just popping up and saying something once. We have to come up with a, a long-term narrative, a long-term theme, and keep telling chapters of that story. So you kind of draw it out. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think as well, the other key, key thing is we have to say things more than once. Right. You know, generally, we kind of feel, well, we, we did that. We did that press release last week, so we've done it. So we're moving on to the next thing. But if you look at how politicians do this, and you know, they're, they're often amongst the best PR people in the world, they've got three messages. They repeat them endlessly for months on end months on end, and those guys are at the top of the nightly news on the front page of the newspaper every day, and still, if you asked 100 people in the street, you know, 10 or 20 of them would think that Mamahan Singh was still the Prime Minister. So if they, if they struggle to get their messages across, then imagine how it is for a brand. We need to be keeping on saying the same messages in a different way. I think we're losing out on a bit, a lot of us are losing out pieces of that by not reiterating the message enough. Uh, moving on a bit, in terms of understanding the audience and audience profiling. I think this, as PR people and communicators, there's a fair bit in terms of uh, understanding of the audience and research that goes behind it. Uh, you know, looking at your journalist hat uh, when you had one on, is that something that, you know, you might uh, kind of showcase for us? What kind of research uh, requirement do you need in audience profiling and understanding of the audience? Um, A little higher? A bit, sure. Thank you. Audience research. Um, well, I, I think when I was a journalist, it was, it was more, I mean, there was, a, there was a certain amount of thinking about what the audience wanted to 
wanted to hear. Right. Uh, and certainly for us, for us now, we're, we're increasingly in, in, in Nissan globally moving to, away from the idea that we need to try to boil the ocean and that we need to try to say something to everybody to really thinking who do we actually need to talk to and what do they think, what are their perceptions and how do we want those perceptions to change. So we're, try, we're kind of narrowing down and getting more, getting more granular. But what, one thing that's interesting about, interesting about journalism, I think, is that, and I think this is kind of relevant to PRs, is that actually we're not kind of researching usually and kind of looking for, for stories. We usually know what the story is because it's the big news story of the day. And what we're looking and then for you is a way to, to make the it. audience? Yeah, we're looking, we're looking for a way to try to make that story. You know, we're, we're not really looking for the story. We're looking for a way to, you know, we know the story. How are we going to make a two-minute piece of television about it? And I think if brands can get into that space as well to become relevant to the thing that's happening anyway on the day. So the understanding of the audience is critical, but the research could be received from somewhere else or created based on... Um, how you perceive the story, is that correct? In terms of audience research, or in ter for audience research for us now at Nissan, we're, we're, we're increasingly going into data, okay. uh, and really, look, really looking closely at the data. I mean, right. To be honest with you, I'm a consumer of it, I'm not clever enough to, to get it, sure. and analyze it, um, but we're, we're increasingly going into, into quite intense data. Understood. Work. I think we're fast running out of time, so um, thank you Roland very much. And if it's a pleasure speaking to you, I want one of those pairs of uh, self-parking uh, <laughs> slippers. It'd be great yeah. if they could take you down the street, wouldn't it? You know, yes, just absolutely. Stand, stand there and take absolutely. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very it's much indeed. Thank you. Bye.